Hi, my name is Mark Ward and I'm the festival programmer for the Redline Book Festival brought to you by Set Dublin Libraries. We're delighted to be celebrating our 10th anniversary festival with 84 events happening in person, online or both. Please check out redlinebookfestival.ie for the full program and the festival runs until Sunday the 17th of October. We're delighted to be marking the landmark publication of John McAuliffe's Selected Poems, published by Gallery Press. John will be in conversation with Polish and Karkonet publisher Michael Schmidt. We'll have a whole host of other poetry events throughout the festival. Tomorrow in person we'll have our new collections event with Amanda Bell, Eleanor Hooker and David Butler. We'll also have Liz Quirk and Amarini Caron in conversation about their second collections with poet Jessica Trainer on Thursday the 14th of October. Also, Victoria Kenefick, Eva Lyle and Jessica Trainer will be talking about literary motherhood on Thursday the 14th of October. But first, we're delighted to welcome you into John McAuliffe's Selected Poems. It's a great joy to be uh, introducing John McAuliffe's Selected Poems, a book which is being published, as it were, today. John is uh, my associate publisher at Carcanet Press. He is a wonderful teacher, and this is effectively his sixth book from the legendary Gallery Press. Um, John was born in 1973, and you might think it's very early in, in his life, as it were, to have a selected poems uh, materializing. Um, and um, it's a wonderful book, a very rich and quite a long book. He has published uh, five collections already, and uh, this distillation of those five collections um, is, uh, is quite a substantial achievement. His first book was published in 2002. It was called A Better Life, and it was published while he had, when he had come to uh, live in England. Um, and uh, he re was recalling the other day in conversation the great excitement of receiving that parcel. In fact, we were talking on the phone the moment that his selected poems arrived at his home in, uh, mm. in uh, Manchester, and uh, he was re-experiencing that kind of elation that comes when you, when you, right. have, when you have a book. Um, John, do you, want, do, you, <clears throat> do you want to reflect on the reception of that first book, A Better Life, in 2002, when you were a mere 29 years old? Sure. Thanks, Michael. And it's a pleasure to be talking to you this morning um, about the book, um, which has only just recently arrived, so I'm just, uh, just getting used to it. Um, I had just moved to London when A Better Life came out in 2002. Um, and I was, uh, you know, working at various jobs and things and trying to uh, get the poems out into the journals, into PN Review and into um, Poetry Ireland and those places. And for the book to suddenly arrive was a great, um, a great excitement. Um, and the, the book, you know, was shortlisted for a forward prize. And I, I think that was my first, um, my first time in Manchester was reading up here as part of the then Manchester Poetry Festival. Um, and I read that night with uh, poets who would, uh, who, of course, my, my writing life has paralleled um, over the years um, subsequently. But I met people that night just on a one-off, uh, Matthew Welton um, and Chris Gribble and others who I've continued to see on and off for years afterwards. But what I most remember that night was that the event was held as an experiment in a nightclub. And to get to where the uh, VIP suite, where the poetry reading was on, you had to go past the speed dating session. So there was a random sample of about 100 people speed dating one another. And my feeling that night, we had, I would say, a select crowd was that um, we lost a number of our potential audience to the speed dating session, which was going on in Tiger Tiger. <laughs> but um, the, the book was, a, was for me, it, it put me into conversation with my contemporaries. Um, and it made me think about my own work in relation to um, what was going on around me, which is always one of the shaping processes of your, you know, your, your interest in writing poems. And then as you begin to think of a book, you're trying to think, well, what, what is it that I'm doing which is going to be um, uh, different to my kind of, why, why should my book uh, be out there along when there's so much um, else out there? And I, you know, I was, very, I was very sure that I had a place uh, with that first book. And I look back at it now, and of course, I, I love seeing those poems, but it's very, it's a kind of a slightly um, nostalgic uh, kind of uh, a look at that book as well as it was formed. Well, when you look at the, at the contents of that first book, it, it is an astonishing achievement in the sense that 
you give the sense that you know where you're going. I mean, most first books, uh, certainly mine, uh, had absolutely no idea where I was going, and um, <laughs> I've never quite found out since then. But um, when you wrote uh, today's imperative, for example, which was um, uh, based on a poem of Horace's, where Horace himself is setting out his his stall, it seems to me you're setting out your stall and um, doing it in a kind of compelling way. What's so compelling about it is that it connects to Horace. And I mean, Horace is such a wonderful model. He comes in at the beginning of your new selected and, and then towards the end as well. He's, he's a poet you refer to quite a lot. I wonder if you could read that poem and talk a little bit about it. Today's sure. Imperative. Um, it's on page 30 in mm -hmm. case you're looking for it. <laughs> Thank you. I have it here. So, um, so yeah, this poem, um, I, I came across Horace through Odin, I think. And, um, uh, and so I, and, it, and it is a, Horace is a poet I, I love reading. And what I love about Horace is his way that he can absorb so many different um, ideas and come out at the other end with this, as you say, this kind of clear sense of direction, this great confidence um, in his writing. And even if he is um, unsure about the quality of some of the uh, things that he is uh, referring to, um, he's not unsympathetic. Um, to uh, bad work and good work coexisting. Um, so I, and I, and I love that. Do you read him no, in Latin? I, I, read him? No, I read him, I read him through uh, multiple translations and then working across from, from dictionaries with the Latin as well. So you know, I never yeah. studied Latin at school, but I, I had a Latin primers that I used um, when I was, and I've, I've I have done versions. Translation is a bit much, I guess, but versions and responses mm -hmm. to Latin something that I, I kind of do um, on and off and have done for 20 years or so. So here, here's this poem, and it's after um, Ode 1-7, um, which I've titled uh, Today's Imperative. Others have herb life, bog land, the bird sanctuary, our man-made canals and urban decay. And they have international flights of fancy too. But wherever they go, it all looks and sounds the same to me. Mountains, some work, a nice sunrise that none of the other tourists sees, or an epiphany that signals a deeper engagement with the local patois, native literature. Then there are the Argonauts, who labour in the interstices of a language, or two at most, and that crowd whose ambition is to introduce gender to the reader who hasn't got one on him. Long warm-ups, agreed movements from A to B, and put up the shutters with a lyrical turn or various little-known fabrics and figures, such as you often find in those who use family detail as glitter to stud the rough black rock of their fictions. And I like all this, but it doesn't live in me. It doesn't wake me up in my skin at night. I'd rather sing to you about what's imperative. So listen. Take your mind off the stresses and anxiety of life. And whether you're in a southern town like Cork or Montpellier or even Washington or Rome, go pour yourself a glass of wine. Now, imagine the kind of man who trusts himself to fortune and says, let us go wherever it takes us. We've heard that a better life awaits and we've seen worse. Today, banish worry, exile it. The night's young now and soon we'll be back to the grind. In fact, maybe tomorrow. I love the phrase international flights of fancy. It seems to me a description also, of, 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 in a sense, of your life, because you're th at that period, you were certainly gallivanting quite a lot, weren't you? You were, you were, you were occupying chairs abroad. You were, you were, the, the, you were the, what was that chair you had in the States? The, um, it was the Heimboldt chair. I had the Heimboldt, I had the Heimboldt chair, yes, a little bit after that. But I had, I had also, I had spent time working in Illinois as well, um, yeah. as well as various other bits and bobs, and doing that kind of freelancing life, which every writer knows, um, which is pretty much what I spent my 20s doing, doing uh, bits of research at universities, bits of high school teaching, university teaching, journalism, the usual run of things. Yeah, and meeting people and uh, expanding your horizons in lots of ways. I mean, uh, you must be one of the best traveled of the Irish poets of your generation, or or, or do they all as or gallivant? I think I think actually it is a generational thing, Michael, and I think it is something which um, it was a real change, um, and it was the it was you know the dreadful Ryanair, you know who we all complain about, but it was very very easy for us to get around, 
Um, so many of the uh, many of my generation will have, you know, it, we work at, at, in different countries um, outside of Ireland. A lot of the poets in their in their forties and fifties, and all through their twenties and thirties, would have been um, pursuing work um, in the in the in the Anglo sphere mostly, but not just. Um, so yeah, I think I think it, it was a distinctive change. Um, and it was to do with the EU, and it was to do with Europe mostly, but a lot in the US also. Mm. Though you travel a lot, it seems to me your imagination is always very much uh, uh, drawn back to, uh, tethered in, if you like, the list of your childhood and uh, of your of your development, if you like, your early development. Um, yeah. there, there is that point in the street which you referred to, which which might be one to look at too. Sure. I'll, I'll read that poem now because it was a really important poem to me because I grew up, as you say, Michael, in, in Listowel, which is um, a small market town in North Kerry. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a great place for a writer to grow up in, um, in some senses, because there was an unusual um, context in that there were at least two professional writers in the town. And one of them was the publican, John B. Keane. And the other was the short story writer and memoirist, um, Brian McMahon. And John B. Um, ran a pub, which his son Billy does still, also a writer. And um, Brian had been um, a primary school teacher and headmaster um, at the primary school um, that I attended when I um, arrived in the store. He was retired from there. But I, I, we all had a sense in the town that... You know, where there was an, if there was something that was wrong, and there were a lot of things wrong um, for teenagers, of course, in a in a town that we wanted to get rid of and that we wanted to protest against, that a perfectly natural thing to do would be to try to write a play about it or to work up poems. So um, writing and poetry and, um, and drama especially were just part of um, what teenagers did in the town. So I think that's quite unusual. I'm not sure that um, it, it wasn't a secret or a private, it was a secret and a private activity as well, of course. But there was a sense always that um, art belonged on the street and it belonged in the in the civic world and had a contribution to make um, to its own moment. Um, so that's my sermon on um, <laughs> on that. And I'm going to read this um, this poem, "The Street," which is dedicated um, to John B. King, and it's ded- dedicated to John B. because I sent it to him um, before I published it, and um, and he wrote me back. Uh, he wrote me back a terrific letter about the about the poem at the time, and his own uh, one of his own key poems um, that he wrote as a young man was also called um, "The Street." Uh, the street for John B. King. On the on, I, what else should I tell you? I don't know. The, 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 the home, my hometown is also famous for its race meeting, and that's what's going on in the background here. On the street, you wouldn't know what was just finishing, swept clean already of dockets and tickets. A mingled smell gone of cigars, straw, horses. Birds' lorries rumble out of town past late mass traffic, the odd mitching teenager, and us shopping for the papers before we drive away home to Dublin. 12.15, and the whole clean town like a set that's just been deserted. The loudspeakers broadcast Radio Kerry to no one. A boy drizzles water into window boxes above the archway. A man puts a box accordion into the boot of his Datsun. In jets, the news is someone stepped in front of the cork train. Might the match be delayed? Nobody can say. The LNN's shop assistant is glad the week is gone. Now at last, things will quieten down, but you're off anyway. She measures our life like a basket of shopping, and we make out the days ahead. School traffic, the rustle of shops, the street's habitual walkers, the wash of rumour, Drift of late night talk of money made and lost, winter settling in the street till it's black and white with rain and frost. That's a wonderful poem. It's it's it, when I look at the at your bibliography. It's nice to have a bibliography when you're as young as you are. Um, <laughs> uh, your books seem to follow every four or five years, don't they? And your second book came in two thousand and seven. It was called Next Door. Um, I'm wondering how different a first and a second book are. With the first book, you have the huge long tail, which goes right back to your infancy. But the second book has got a much sort of smaller measure. What what is it like to produce a second book? I think that's absolutely right, Michael. And I think an awful lot of people, their second books are about coping with their first book because you don't really know what it's like to have 
uh, the authority of somebody who has a book. Now, I'm not saying it's a great authority, but there's something out there in your name in the world for which you, as a person who's still growing, are held to account. And it's quite a, it's quite a shock. And I do think that there, some people, it comes very naturally to them. You know, this is something that they, and, and I, I, but I did, I did have a lot to see what I had done. And of course, one of the strange things about poems, Michael, as you know, is that it can often be many, many years, if at all, before we understand exactly what our poems are about. You know, they are mm. sorts of um, contraptions which we set up and we elaborate and we're so deep in them that we sometimes miss um, some of the things that they are also saying. Um, mm. And after the, after the first book, um, which a couple of things happened. One, I was trying to think through what I wanted the other book to be that would be different to the first book. Um, I wanted it to be more explicit in some senses. I thought that, and it's, I, I, I love subtlety in poems. It's something I'm very keen on, but I wanted it to be more explicit. So the book is called Next Door. And it was about trying to think about Britain and Ireland as next door neighbours. It was about trying to think about living a life in a, in a neighbourhood. And there were all kinds of contexts that I had for that. So it was maybe a little bit more um, uh, on point than that. But the other thing that happened was that I was suddenly working um, in London, uh, you know, working at all kinds of jobs, making uh, ends meet, and also in Manchester, settling into uh, my job by the end of the book. And I just didn't have much time. So one of the things I noticed was I was writing shorter poems, you know, yes. and, um, and it, you know, because your, your focus and, and your actually your time. And, I, and, I, and I, I noticed this after the second book. And again, at that point, tried to change my practice so that I was giving myself longer runs at things because I didn't want that sense that I was kind of cut off. But here's another mm. uh, shocking thought. In my imagination, I always thought this second book was very different to the first book. I knew what I was doing, but going back to read it again for the selected, all I could see was how like the first book it actually was, in spite of my determined uh, <laughs> intent to have taken things in another direction. I'm just kind of like going, oh yeah, um, there's the metaphor there, there's the, there's the lines that go there, there's how the stanzas work, check, check, check. And I thought I was doing something very, um, <laughs> very different, but I suppose what's more apparent to me now is the continuities. Um, between the between the two books, but you also had uh, the experience of having set, well settled down and and um, started a family, and I think that that actually is is one of the the, the things that, that you notice is the family poems coming in here. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, That's right. So that that was a, a change of life. Um, would you like to to look at a couple of the poems from perhaps uh, perhaps by accident, which is one of the family poems you drew attention to? Yes. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And I think um, this, one of the things I, I, I thought as I was trying to write this book was with small children around the house, it became apparent to me that I, I was constantly being called away from the, um, the poem I was, I was trying to write by the noises around me. And at some point in the process of writing the book, I suddenly re realized that I, I had to incorporate the noises around me into the poems that they have to be part of my um, subject. Um, and it's a, it's a Pasternak line, this idea that poems must absorb their own occasion. And um, in, in, in the way that I read that line, it meant so much to me. And it opened up um, the material for writing about or drawing on um, the kind of family life um, in the house and bringing it into um, poems, which not, need not necessarily be about family life or anything, um, but this one certainly is. And it's called By Accident. The night our boy fell, I was running late. I made the unanswered call under the city's bright and cloudy skull. And as the needle nose the north trembled at the shock ahead, a house blacked out and silent, a night that commuted, ran to earth in accident, a shorted circuit, you and he locked into the diagnostic dark in Park Royal Intensive Care, where consequences arc beyond contusion, fracture, the ward's humming network to a different city a year later, a kind of night, calm, almost tranquil, when he calls and haggles with his sister, even as we find more and more unreal our imaginings, which were terrible. 
It's a wonderful poem. It seems to me you, you know it by heart as well. And I see you, 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 you glance down at the page, but it seems to be coming from inside rather than from, from, from the page. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful Well, you know what it's like? <laughs> yes, it is one of these, <laughs> one of these little poems which yeah, sticks yeah. around in my own head. And again, one of the things mm-hmm. I think that when you're writing with children is, in, in poems is you, you're writing about beginnings, but you're also all of a sudden you have this terrible um, awareness of, of endings all of a sudden become, yeah. becomes real yeah. in a way that maybe never have, have, have been before. Right. Um, there's some wonderful poems. It's, 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 it is, I was surprised to see how many, you talk about shorter poems, how many of your poems are sonnets in this, in this collection. You, you are, mm-hmm. I think, a sonneteer at heart. Um, the one, the one that I like best in this book, I think, of all the poems, is, is the Deep North, with some wonderful sentences. And my very favorite image seems to be um, with their heads buried all the while in table-sized road maps that approximate to where they live. And um, the syntax is very elaborate. And occasionally, I think, oh my gosh, he's made a he's made a, a mistake in his syntax. But on the whole, I think there's only one point of which I won't bring up today where there may be an error or. The, the syntax is complex and wonderful. You know, it's it's great to follow. Let's can you do that one, the Deep North? Sure. Is this long road to the Deep? North? Is this is this a? It is. It's the narrow the narrow road to the Deep North is what I'm thinking of here, yeah. um, and it's a poem which uh, it takes its bearings from a number of things. But I think Northern Ireland and what happens in Northern Ireland is something which any any writer or anybody in in, in Ireland grows up with a consciousness of that always on. Uh, you know, sometimes at the center of your vision and sometimes in the blurry edges of your vision. And this is a poem which 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 responds a little bit to that. But it's also thinking about Japan, um, as did so many of the great Northern Irish poets when they were trying to trying to find ways to think about what was happening. And uh, here it is, the deep north. The weather is coming down around them and filling up the fields. But they are Sunday drivers, stuck in a dead end with their heads buried all the while in table-sized road maps that approximate where they live in what we'll call the whole of the present life. Its walls loud and impermeable as radio and its roof screwed shut so they barely notice the emissaries of the whole of the Western paradise who dwell among them at crossroads in courtyards and country lanes who take many guises whose form is fluid and inconstant who will receive the souls of the dying believers, who on their vests wear the names of those who paid for their creation, who carry in one hand a rope for binding and in the other a knife. See, that's one sentence. That's one long sentence, you see? Yeah. You did it with one breath. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what lungs yeah. you have as a <laughs> <laughs> There, there, this, this is a wonderful book. I think it's. I do think it's very different from from a better life. And p- part of it is is of course technical differences. You know, you 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 have ch- challenged yourself more in various ways. Um, is there anything else you'd like to read from this book that you that you feel we would relish? No, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. I'm happy to um, to move on maybe and talk about the next one. And I'm glad you see its difference. You're always very happy to think that you have variety in your work, um, Michael. <laughs> rather than the, same things happening again. So mm. good to hear. Okay. Let us let us fare forward to, uh, of all places, um, 2011. Uh, you were by then settled into Manchester, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, I and came to Manchester. In, yes, I came to Manchester in 2004. Um, and so I'd been here I, right before this book came out. I... I, I, I did spend uh, six months in Philadelphia, um, which really helped me, gave me time to write, you know, it gave me time to expand on and, um, and think through poems. And it was also at that time that I began to use pamphlet publication as a sort of interim way to trial the poems mm-hmm. and to, to, to give me a sort of a lift off into the book. And I, and I've, I, I've loved doing that, uh, being able to um, put together 10 to 15 poems. Um, as a unit, and then think through what's missing and what it could be to turn it into a book afterwards as well. Yeah, it, 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 it's a wonderful collection. And um, by the way, there's one sad omission from your book is is your Klikovich translations. You know, that was another pamphlet yeah. you did, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, it, but you can't put everything. 
No, and I'll, I'll come back to Igor, Igor's work. I think another time. I think we have another. We have a book in us. I think Igor and myself. Um, yeah, great Bosnia. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you would you look, let, let us look at a bold places? The poem that really struck with me. Well, there, there are many, but the aerialist on page sixty eight is a very strong contender. Sure. Um, so this is um, it's quite a it's quite a long poem. I, I, I always warn everybody uh, before I read this, and it's um, I, I, I've all, when I was uh, at university in Galway, I was taught by John McGahern. Um, the uh, novelist and short story writer, and he was a very, he was a very uh, good and avuncular um, teacher. But I, I remember him talking at that time about how difficult it was to write books which would speak to the way that so many Irish people lived in England and in Ireland, that they had their working life in one place and their family life in another place. And I, 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 at the time, I found that very hard to understand what he was talking about, and I could see him approaching it in his novels and the difficulty of bringing the two cultures together in terms of a point of view which would comprehend them both. But it's, I think it has become an awful lot easier as, it, as, the, as the countries have had a more, uh, uh, more connection and more in common maybe um, over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so. And this mm. book of all places certainly tries to move between the two places as much as it possibly um, can, as I did and as I, as I have done and during my time, as my family has done and so many other families uh, over the last um, few decades. And this is a poem which um, thinks about that and tries to do both places at the same time. And it's also a, a moment in, Ir in Ireland when the Celtic Tiger was in the ascendancy in 2011, um, when the country was changing rapidly. You know, it, it, it had um, to go back to it, was to enter a country which really was remarkably changing in terms of the townscapes um, and in terms of uh, some of the things that, that people... Um, did and this poem uh, is, is thinking about that, but it's also an elegy for an aerialist, um, Italy Karapovitsky, who we just were at a, a local circus and uh, the following night, in a stunt that we saw, um, he the, the poor man died in the uh, in it. So I'll, I'll read the story, which tells this kind of uh, national story, uh, personal story, and then also has this other subject, aerialist in memory of Vitali Karapovitsky. I talked us all back to Ireland, a week in Kilorglan, and a plan to take shovel, bucket, armbands, and an inflatable fin, a picnic basket, and a tartan rug to a different beach each mid-morning. It was quiet, and all worked out so much we might have dreamed it and never gone, except that one day we parked an inch strand and ploughed it up as the tide around us did what it does. Cooped up inside at night, was a different prospect in a rental no one could pretend was Bali or Venice. For entertainment, ice cream vans and posters for a circus, not exactly an infrastructure. The Royal Russian Circus, 20 euro a head. I cursed the Celtic tiger and paid cash at the till, wishing briefly I'd stayed, done an MBA and some violence to the language, lived it deal by deal. Every artist looks after his own props. The balloon exploded into flames. The cage fell and the heavy steel ball. Becoming witnesses, one or 200 people thought it was part of the act. Fire as magic whoosh and clatter. Nothing irregular in the mid-air routine. The reports say he was Belarusian, 26, a clown or an aerialist in a clown costume. And that he threw his wife clear. We'd seen in Ross Bay, pre-show and a week earlier, hanging around, nerveless and going nowhere, an elephant, a giraffe, and between them a zebra. Canvas and steel were shaped into a marquee, and from behind Queen Saharan, glider after glider hung in the sky, posting away clear to the north. A new bungalow advertised art, another a scuba school and night kayaking in the phosphorescent ocean, by which, that night, stars and stripes on each enormous brow, the elephants balanced on buckets like shuttlecocks, while the giraffe nodded, stately and gawky, and a shabby lion made his unheard-of roar, still a memory on each nearby farm. A crowd of method actors, the circus animals, though instead of a tiger, the MC, for the sake of form, squirted water at us from a flower between acts. The sad odds have performed for one year and had one stunt. 
In it, he couldn't find her. She fooled and hid. The story so simple, we gripped the wooden ringside, grinding our heels into the matted grass, and would it ever end? Opened our mouths like parents as he kept falling over and out of the hot air balloon. Over and over he went for a man who would throw his wife clear. Weeks later, and back across the water, I saw online the Dublin owner of the Royal Russians, or its spokesman, speak of close-knit community, the harness, the hoist, and the families of the deceased and bereaved flying over. It seemed for a while here as if things might be as they were, autumn closing in, a net that at the last moment would come apart, taking only the leaves from the trees in the name of the year. That's a wonderfully measured final cadence. I, I, am I entirely wrong to hear some American influences there, like Archibald MacLeish and people of that kind? Probably, I probably am. Am I? Well, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm work, uh, in this poem. What I was working on, I was working on Yeats and Mahan as the as uh-huh. the models. I'm certain Yeats is, finds yeah. his way into those mid-century stanzas as well. Um, where mm-hmm. do you see Archibald MacLeish in there? Uh, it may just be the. It just, just, it's probably just the setting, isn't it? You know, the, the incredible yeah. ball of nothing, 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 nothing at all. But no, no, it's, it's, it's probably too allegorical. You're, you're much more particular. Um, you mentioned order yes. earlier, and, um, and in this poem too, the, the, the politics are very interesting. I mean, they're, they're very uh, enacted, if you like. Um, what is it you love about order? Um, I love. I, I think I love Auden's tone and his and his tune, and I mm. love the way um, I love his this what's omnivorous in his poems and his sense that nothing is alien to him as a writer, and mm-hmm. and this this might, need not always be praised, but that nothing is unsayable. You know that he will that he will he will drag in um, his reading and philosophy alongside what he saw downtown. And I think that is, that is um, and he, he aspires, there's something conversational about his poems, even the songs, the ballads, where they don't, I don't ever think that they're the last word. I always feel like I want to talk back to an Auden poem. And I feel like I've been challenged to think something. And I feel like I'm part of, a, of an ongoing conversation with the poems. When I put them away and pick them up years later, I'm still back into mm. the middle of in praise of limestone. I'm going, oh, and what about? And I feel so that's why that's what I love about Alden's poems. And um they don't have a they don't close um like a box um mm. on me as a as a reader. So mm. yeah, that's uh, it that's is true. He is he does, he's a dialogue poet, isn't he? He really does keep and, and you keep uh, discovering new things in in his uh in his diction and so on. So he's he's never you do. He's never, and I think he also never he changes his mind as well, doesn't he, Michael? So as you read him and you read the early Auden against the middle Auden, um, against the later Auden, there is a kind of a conversation going on within the books, which it is, mm. um, and I have, and from, your, from you know, reading to reading, there will be parts of Auden that I love. So at the moment, I'm back into the orators again, you know, and yes. thinking about the absolute... Uh, the brio and buzz that comes from uh, the excitement that's in him as he's writing these poems. But for years, it was another time and the, the work of the late 30s and early 40s that I really loved. Hmm. Well, when he was revising his work, when he was, uh, as it were, collecting and reviewing his work, he would revise it. He would revise his, his early poems in, in, in later life. Were you tempted to do this as you reread your earlier work or did you just omit the poems that you thought might be, might be improved? Did you make any changes? Um, I, I, I did make some changes. I made a few very small changes, but mostly I chose poems which I which I was um, I was I was I was finished with. So that, mm. um, for example, uh, the deep north um, that that, I, that was just called the weather, and it just it struck me at the time as a title that I couldn't I, I hadn't gotten right, um, mm. and I knew exactly what I was doing, and I needed to bring the title closer to the poem. Um, and so a couple of very small changes, um, here and there. Um, and I guess that's probably more in the first two books. There was the ending of one poem, which, um, I actually, I, I scribbled into the book shortly after that book was published, uh, which, uh, which also, um, has changed. 
but I think everything from um, of all places onwards is pretty much um, as as it was, mm-hmm. as it is, as it is. Um, from of all places, you might want to to choose one of the one of the Odin's poems, perhaps. Sure. Maybe well, I, I, I might back. read. Um, yeah, I, I'll read. I'll, I might read the coming times, Michael. Um, okay. Because it's. Um, it's a poem which really takes its bearings from the fall of Rome. One of my um, one of my favourite Auden poems. Um, so, um, the fall of Rome is uh, got this mix of tones that Auden has, which I'm just full of admiration for. I wish there was more poetry like it in the world, you know. So I wanted to make my contribution. Where you've got kind of co- apocalypse. Um, but also just wit as well. Um, the coming times. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should say about this. And I'm not, you know, it's a terrible thing to put Auden up as a model as well. And um, so I'm not doing that. Uh, you know, you know, I don't want to be judged by Auden's standard, but I do, I do want to take my bearings from him. And, and I love the uh, mixed nature of his politics as well. That his politics is personal. Um, as well as social, and he won't allow one to override the other um, in his poems. And he also believes in poetry as its own um, space, whose virtues and flexibilities um, should not be um, reduced down um, for other purposes. Okay, (laughs) so here it is, the coming times. The towns are not so dark that no one enters. In nearby docks, the nights advance on empty lots. Fanatics gather in community centres. A dry spell engenders nostalgia for rain. The news will consider a negligent doctor and who is immune to the variant strain. In cooler queues, low-slung jeans date the waspy. The bright bars are smoke-free as the ocean's photic zones. The downturn floats the clearance sail. Staff migrate and the market anticipates no return. Churches fill. The ice cap melts, the deserts spread. North and south, a dolphin's found in every port. New forms of algae feather the tide. The boats will travel day and night and some make land. For the time being, out of mind is out of sight. From the dawning dark, no one shouts, no walkouts. Someone organises scouts. Someone patrols the park. <laughs> Very wonderful, excellent. Um, we we are, as it were, creeping up on the present. Uh, and your your next collection is called "The Way In." Now there is another collection called "The Way In" by another poet. Do you, does that ring any bells with you? Yeah, Michael, I actually, I, 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 spoke, I spoke to you about this. Yes, uh, yeah. So <laughs> it's um, it's Charles Charles Tomlinson. Charles Tomlinson, that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's his, um, it's and his it was, most political as well. It is indeed. And it also has, more, I think, I would say more of the world in it um, yeah. than, any of his other, than any of his other books. And it's also possibly a book of his which is most like Larkin, not a poet that he would be particularly keen to be associated with, but it's vistas of the towns and cities and landscapes and the poets um, making room for other voices alongside his own in the world of the poems mm-hmm. is something that I really admired in that book, which is, a, I think it's 1973, that book. So quite yeah, early in Harkonnen's um, history as well. So yes, I did, yeah. have, I did have that in mind as yes. um, yeah. a counterpoint. And it's a, my book is also, it, it, that book, the, my way in is, is, is full of, uh, travel writing, you know, and and trying to trying to travel around parts of Ireland and parts of and parts of England and elsewhere, actually, in the book as well, in, in a way that I liked um, Tomlinson do, um, doing that in in his book too. Yeah, yeah, it's a very Irish book the way in, isn't it? Um, there is there is a lot of Ireland. Oh, there's a lot of Ireland in all your work, but um, there seems to be quite a lot of it in this book. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe this is one. Of, yeah, it's one of the things that happens. I think possibly that you know. I, I am over and back a lot. I was at that point, I was um, doing a lot of work with the Irish Arts Council. So I was seeing a lot of places and, and beginning to think about Ireland in a slightly different way. And I was also, I, I've always been really, really interested in a kind of a strand of Irish writing, which is, um, which is 
kind of of both nations and of of two languages as well. And so Edmund Spencer um, was a poet that I started um, to try and uh, think with um, in this book. And I was using um, some of his Colin Clout poems where he's in Cork uh, wishing he were back in London. And then when it comes down to it, staying in Cork and realizing he doesn't want to go back to those bastards anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, so I, and, I, and, he, and he kind of, he talks up about where he is and how it works and, and contrasts it with what he has left. So I found that quite an interesting way in, uh, pardon the phrase, to thinking about um, these poems in this book. That's wonderful. There's one poem here dedicated to Peter Fallon, your wonderful publisher, um, Shed. Want to read that one? Yes. Sure, I'd love to. So this is um, this is a this is a this is a, a, a resolutely uh, this is a, a poem set in in Withington in in South Manchester where I live. Um, but again, as I as I as I always try to do with these poems, you're taking your bearings from what's around you to speak to other other things as well. Um, so here's shed. Uh, I bought the shed for a song of a neighbour. He'd stopped using it after he paved the garden. He'd inherited it or got it somewhere he couldn't remember. Not that I gave a second thought to its origin. It was heavier than it looked, so he helped take the roof to pieces. After an hour, prying out each crooked tack, we levered off its grey-green sandpaper stiffness and rested it on the drive, like a book stranded on its back. The neighbour, looking at his watch, said, let's push, and the four walls and floor did move a little. In front of the garage, sweating, feeling each ounce of the previous night, we saw too late it was too big to go through. We counted the nails, but couldn't. They were like stars, more the more we looked. Heave it over. Over the garage and down, he joked, the garden path to its resting place under the magnolia. No joke. We made a ramp of the ladder and inched this half-ton pine crate up and out of the road. The scraped flat garage roof pitched under our careful feet. Two euphoric beers later, after we'd lowered it into place, we agreed on 20 quid. Every so often, he still calls in. Today, he's selling up and getting out. He asks about the shed. I say it's fine, so half-hidden by April gusts of leaf and petal, he can hardly see it as we look out the window at where it leans against the fence, painted green, the unlocked door opening on the lawnmower and half full cans of paint and petrol, pure potential evaporating into the air. But work makes work. Paving the lot, he volunteers, makes more sense. I'm offering him a cup of tea when, before he can collect himself, he starts to resent the 20 quid and leaving the shed behind. It was, he says, almost free. <laughs> Very good. I'm, I'm aware of the fact that time is passing. And as we approach the present, of course, many of us remember your, your launches of the Kabul Olympics last year. Um, well, do we? Yes, there was. There were a couple of, before lockdown, there were a couple of, of events. No, there, everything, ha- everything happened oh, online, no. Michael. Oh, no. Oh, I mean, it's been... It's been- so I don't really want to move on to it quite yet. I'd lo- I would love, we have so little time, but I, I would love us to look at Montevideo, the, your translation of Supervial, sure. but I think that may, may not be central. What do you think? I'd love um, to read it, actually, if that's okay. okay. Will, I read, will I read it? Um, it's uh, so it's Jules Supervay. Yeah, he's a wonderful Franco-Uruguayan poet um, who I came across in, the, in a book by Moniza Alvi. Um, and I found the poems just, you know, sometimes, Michael, you find poets who are congenial and, yeah. um, and he's one of them for me. I find it, um, mm. and, you know, blessedly my French is school French and I can, I, and his French is, is, is quite, it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward. Um, so, and it's very easy for me to get a purchase on where he's coming from, from poem to poem. Um, this one is, uh, I've, I have really, uh, it is a version again, it is a response which, uh, takes his, his rhymes and his, um, stanzas. And I love the way that he plays with stanzas and he begins with couplets and shifts to quatrains 
And I think that that um, lovely, open, uh, flexible approach to form, again, is something that I'm really, really interested in in poems. So there's almost a dialogue set up between the couplets and the quatrains um, in the poem. So here it is, Montevideo, which is um, where Supervé was born. Um, and for me, I was born in Roscommon, um, in the west of Ireland. And uh, uh, so I, I set the poem there. Now, I, I decided that keeping the name Montevideo was irresistible. I did not go for a Roscommon as the title of the poem. Montevideo after Jules Supervé. I was being born, and at the window, passing by, was the horse pulling the plough in from the brightening edge of the far field, a mosaic which tile by tile the light revealed. Who was driving it? Whoever was up woke the day with the little pop of his whip. Night's other element, an archipelago afloat above the day he had started. Walls raising themselves from the sand and cement and river gravel that had waited in them, sleeping tight. A little bit of soul, my soul, slipped by along a blue rail, a line in the sky. And another bit folded itself into a sheet of paper, under sail, adrift. Till it lodged under a stone, its wildness caught and settled down. The morning counted its birds, never losing its place. That sweet honeysuckle smell gave itself to the morning's blue swell. In Ireland, on the Atlantic, the air was so affable, such a tonic, that the colours of the horizon came closer to see the houses we had lived in. It was me being born. There, where the woods almost speak, on whose paths the grass grows, surely, but not too quick. Underwater, equally, seaweed and algae bob and wave. The wind, too, will fall for them, they make believe. Earth, always about to begin again its orbit, recognises us in its atmospheric dips, feels in the wave and in its profoundest deeps, the swimmer's head, the diver's feet. I'm so glad you read that poem. It's, it's beautiful. It also tells us a lot, I think, about the ways in which you use rhyme. Um, you use it, and then you don't use it, and then you use it, and then you don't use it. It's, there's this wonderful sense of freedom, and uh, you create a pattern of expectation, and then you betray it, and then you reestablish it again. I mean, just one <laughs> talks about that. Every surprise has to be prepared for. You know, there's no such thing as a surprise that isn't prepared for in this way. It's, it's a wonderful poem. We, we do approach, uh, as it were, um, the Final bell, and I would. I do hope we have time to, to um, be fair to the uh, Kabul Olympics. Um, the uh, there is also the elegy for for Derek Mahan at the end of the book, which I would be very nice to read. Um, wh how would you like to handle the Olympics as we as we approach this this last chapter? Well, I I, I might just say something about it, maybe Michael, and then read one poem from it, and then maybe finish with the elegy for Derek Mann, if that yeah. sounds um, that okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I love the, the Kabul Olympic. Oh, good. <laughs> 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 um, this book kind of grew out of well, it grew out of some poems, but one of the things about living in Manchester, it has probably got a lot more of um, the city in it um, than other books, is how. Uh, how you know the city has changed so much, and the streets, which when I arrived were you know had bits of Irish community in them, along with um, Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities, are now um, mostly Syrian and Libyan. And I got really, really interested, especially in looking at the Libyan community um, in Manchester and trying to think about um, because the Libyan <laughs> Libya played a, quite a big role in my uh, teenage years as well, because they were kind of central international supporters. Um, of the I, of the IRA um, in Ireland, so there's a sort of a tally there which gave me kind of an interest in it, and then getting to know some of the um, Libyan community here and drawing out some of the things I um, discovered about that community in the city kind of fed some new poems for me. I think I'm not sure if we have time to read the long poem um, "City of Trees" from that, um, but what do you think, Michael? I, give it a give it a give it a whirl. It's, it is a wonderful poem. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll go with City of Trees because I think it represents sort of the lots of things that are going on in the book, um, and it has some wonderful so, epigraphs as well. <laughs> so it has yeah, two wonderful epigraphs. 
Yes. So the, the epigraphs, um, it's, a, it's a poem which remembers the, um, the, the bombing of the Manchester Arena um, in 2017. And the first epigraph uh, comes from Philip Larkin, and their greenness is a kind of grief. And the second is from Oscar Wilde, where he says, I would give Manchester back to the shepherds, you know, an anti-industrial um, response to the city. At the, town, at the town hall, valedictory do, the curator's art in parks, her metal tree, and the gallery's diversity get credit, which she abjures. Look is a residue of design, a quote which around the room sparks applause, not for herself or the line, nor of course the fact that she is heading south, but that it asks for this new order to be acknowledged and sees the city's sprawl as managed. Cycling back, under the candled chestnuts, past the gallery and through the Curry Mile's neon influence, its last two Irish pubs, the Clarence and the Whitworth, refitted now as a Christian cafe and a chrome and glass shisha bar. The crowd is nothing on the night 20,000 Libyans gathered at the southern end, celebrating the death of Gaddafi, hours after it was announced on the BBC, his old beehive building they'd camped beside in protests for months. Fireworks, flags, biscuit tin drums and gunshots. A party for the ages. Like that afternoon on the allotment, digging in the spuds when the neighbourly encore of cheers rolled in. Aguero going global on the end of Balotelli's flick. City going wild, submerging in its element those who'd once thought otherwise. Mental. By the time I got home, the news had pictures. A roadblock, ambulances and squad cars pulled up outside the arena. Overnight it was first numbers, then names, and the council leader on the town hall steps in the same shirt I'd seen him in 12 hours earlier, and the mayor taking the microphone to promise business as usual, and not exactly a steely line he would repeat. Likewise, the city will not be divided and goes from strength to strength. A man is arrested outside the Morrisons in Charlton, a door is blown in in Fallowfield, where the Lebo cargo van would park, white police trucks mark the corners. At a concert, I dismantle the book bag I've lugged from work while the metal detector queue slows and meanders. The summer nights demand updates. We write to friends about our kids. The schools stay open as they process. Classmates' tales of sleeping in a hotel overnight. The footage of a man with luggage on wheels buying bits and pieces in a corner shop circulates. This watchful ex-student, born here, ill at ease, walking through the May weeks of the tree's slow green explosions, the air thick with willow pollen and honeysuckle, all invisible in the grayscale's pixel rendering of the place, scrambling it even as crowds gather elsewhere, in shops and bars and streets to shoot the breeze, watch a match on telly and follow their phones, as I do, student of uprootings and aftermath, hemmed in by the information which descends on us like summer rain, the stories and images as much a distraction as each attempt to make it all align. Sequence, getting out of order, which would track us as we move on from the rooms and fields and trees of the city's hundred towns, we separating griefs, harden and endure. Again, you have that astonishing syntax at work. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's almost Miltonic. It's, um, and again, that ties in in a sense of the politics of it, doesn't it? Very, yeah. very, yeah. it doesn't let you go. Thank On the other hand, it doesn't uh, apologize. <laughs> no, no. Co complex and interesting material. And I guess you do, as a writer, you, 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 you feel challenged by by trying to make it work and trying to get sentences and lines and stanzas that will try to get as much of reality into a poem as you possibly can. And I, I guess mm -hmm. that's something that I, I'm always ambitious for in the poems I'm writing and in the, and in the books I'm reading as well. You, you want a lot from, from them, um, don't you? You do. And I, I think what's also rather wonderful about your poems is they, they, they do owe and repay so many debts to poets that mean a lot to you, that you, that you live with and that you love. Um, and none possibly so much as Derek Mann, who, who commands your final, your, the final poem in the book. Uh, yes. In this yeah. Um, Derek Mann was a poet, I think, when I was 21 and beginning to really think about writing poems as something that I was going to uh, 
um, do. Um, I, I, he, his work I found just electrifying. I just, I, I thought he, 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 the way that he looked at the world um, and the way that he, um, the way that he confronted uh, himself um, and the things of the world and the way that he registered modernity and spoke very clearly, I think, not just to me, but I think to many of the poets of my generation um, in Ireland and in the UK. And he's somebody, I think, who, if you ask, um, and I know you too, Michael, you know how you published uh, Derek and some of his greatest poems in PN Review over the years and um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s as well. He was, a, he was just a, he was unlike anybody else. And there was a clarity in his writing, which I just, uh, which I, I still love. Um, and so I wanted to end this poem with, it was shocking news last October when the news came through because he has had such a prolific and, um, uh, you know, he said, he's, he's he, like, you know, like his great friend and contemporary Seamus Heaney, he, he wrote wonderfully um, at different points all, all across his life. And he ended with this kind of some, some really great poems. So here's this poem. It's called Souterrain. Um, which is an underground chamber, um, and uh, but you know, uh, not not a burial ground so much as as a place where things can be stored and retrieved. Souterrain in memory of Derek Mann. To wait things out underground, laid in with more than a lifetime's treasure, to settle down with the books and study what comes along the line. I understand. This must be around the turn of a millennium. Hidden, the mind will return to a proper dark, freed from daylight distraction to ponder absolutes and the tenses of its own cavernous, echoing interiors, seeing the issue of the day from an ancient prospect. But terrors shake this long night, the texts losing their place soft tissue between some future and the past perfect, the pooled floor rising towards the leaking roof, which gets thundered over. Powerful sounds scatter the animals, and the shears rust in an outhouse, while the motorway is lowered further into the royal hill. There are other sore spots, a pilot light going out at the sun's titanic western edge a reddening field parched by the wind. Myrtle and olive grow across frivolous libraries. The flocks gone to pastures new who would still graze on these flattened fields, their reasonable ground. Imagine going, knowing that what is buried promises discovery, cropping up like braille with a finger to trace, making out the pattern and when it comes to a stop. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank thanks you, Michael. Um, and thanks to Mark and all at Redline as well for having us along today. <laughs>